Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to another edition of Intro to R. So today we're going to talk about something. We're going to move more into uh, what's traditional computer science by looking at automation, um, flow control, uh, looping, conditional, stuff like this uh, with the next series of lectures. Um, our first topic today is functions, and in functions we're going to talk about our environments as well because it's useful to know how those things work um, in terms of uh, what's happening behind the scenes in a function, environments, uh, scoping, and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, just as a reminder that uh, I do have our RMD um, markdown notebooks uh, that have all the code for this lecture posted in the GitHub site, which are, you should be able to uh, find, um, find in the video link. So let's get started. So scoping, looking for things. Um, you know, uh, it, it, not everything can be in memory. Uh, some stuff has to be in storage. And uh, some, even when you're in memory, you have physical locations within the memory that R has to find um, certain functions when you request to use them. So in order to run, um, R has to find it. And the process of searching for this, these objects are called, is called scoping. Um, so scoping searches through all the objects, uh, trying to match um, a name that you request and look at the code in order to run that function. So here's an example of a successful uh, operation. So I'm summing the numbers one through 10, okay, which is 55. Uh, and R finds this function um, and then is able to, to access the code, run it, and then produce an output. Um, if R finds the function, um, that's what happens. If it doesn't, it's gonna return an error could not find function. And so here's what a failure looks like. Again, sum two is the function I'm trying to call, but it can't find this function sum two because I just made that up. So uh, that's what happens when it just can't find what's there, okay? So um, let's talk a little bit about scoping and environments. So R has environments, and these are hierarchical collections of objects, okay? Um, this is to make scoping more efficient for R because otherwise it's gonna like go through all of the packages that you have still looking for all of the functions, right? Looking through all these functions, which is not necessarily great. If you're not using stuff in that package, why do you want R to look through that? You know, that's that's not a good use of, of computational time. So, um, in these environments, the top environment is called the global environment. And that's what we have over here uh, in our studio. Um, the global environment is uh, uh, and contains all the other environments as well. So packages often create their own environments every time they're loaded as well. Um, R uses what's called le lexical scoping to search through objects, uh, including functions inside each environment through the hierarchy. Um, if a patch package isn't loaded, then that environment doesn't exist and it doesn't look there, therefore it can't find what you're looking for. So in our studio, we have this uh, situation. You can cl click here um, and find all the packages that are currently loaded in all their environments, okay? So if it's not there, then you know you haven't loaded it um, in the GUI, okay? so. That's a really useful little piece for our studio. Okay, so like the, let's talk about how lexical scoping actually works. Lexical scoping works through uh, going through these environments to search for that function that you that you want that you're trying to call uh, in a certain order. And you can look at and see search for these orders. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to skip this chunk. Uh, I'm you know this is the little thing that we tried. Okay. Um, and then look for search, okay? So I've already, uh, I've, whoops, I just accidentally loaded uh, Veritas and uh, ggplot2, so my environment's gonna look a little bit different than the environment here. So if you search without loading those packages, what you find is global environment, tools, our studio, package stats, package graphics, package blah, 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 so forth and so on. These are the, the base uh, packages that, that R loads every time that it opens up. So it's like sort of the default situation. So when it searches for these package, it goes one by one through this, through these packages and searches for what you want. Then it goes to this one and it's ordering these, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, so it goes through here. Um, and then when it gets to the end, if it still hasn't found it, it goes into an empty environment. And if you go through an empty environment and it still doesn't find it, then um, that's when you get that error, okay? This order changes when you load a package. So if you load the library ggplot2, you can see this. I've already loaded the ggplot2 and then I loaded Veritas and Veritas Lite as well. So uh, mine's a little bit different here. 
than what's plotted on here on the screen. And that's because I've loaded different packages, okay? So here's the ggplot2 package there. Um, so take a look at how this works from the previous example. So we're gonna step through the successful example of sum. So what it does is it, okay, so if you have your base loaded, not the Viridis or, or ggplot, but you have your base loaded, it's going to go into the global environment. Look at here, it's not found. Uh, it goes into this tools, our studio. Oh, yep, nope, it's not there. But then it goes into the package stats and hey, there it is. It's listed in stats, which is great. It pulls that code, it runs the code and gives you the output, all right? And at that point, the search stops. Uh, for some two, um, it's going to do the same thing, but it's going to get that empty environment and then the search stops and you get the error. Okay, so that's how that works. It's really important um, to know how this works in terms of if you have two functions that are named the same. So this is uh, true in the tidyverse. A lot of times it's going to over, uh, it says it's going to um, mask certain things. And that's because it's loading these packages before things like stats. So if you have something that's named in the stats program that is the same name as sort of tidy R or janitor or something like that, it's gonna hit that package first, find it and then stop. So it's not like it's affecting the thing in stats. It's just R is going to find it first. And so it's, uh, 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 you know, effectively masking the stuff that's, that's loaded second, All right. So I hope that makes sense in terms of this lexical scoping. Um, so there's the error that you get uh, if you don't find it. If it gets that empty environment, then it returns that error. OK, so environments are a good thing to know about. Um, and uh, uh, a couple of environments have special properties. So global environment is special and reserved for user defined objects. This is what you uh, end up if you write some kind of quick little function, let's call it X function, um, you know, uh, let's call it Y is your inputs and Y plus plus one plus two, it's going to pop up in that global environment. You can even look at the code right here if you click that little button, okay? So user-defined objects uh, belong here in the global environment. To list these objects, you can use the, the function list, okay? And it's listing X. If I add H in as one and then list, I'm gonna find H and X, okay? So it's giving you all of the objects within this global environment, which are usually ones that are, are user-defined. Um, so here's another little thing. We can go down here. There's search. Here we go. So we can um, add an additional kipper, kippet, and uh, then list those things out. And you can see there's a bunch of stuff there. Okay, great. Um, package environments can also be investigated using LS, but you need an argument. Okay, so it's not just empty. So you can list uh, the LS package name. So here I'm looking at the package name uh, Viridis Lite. Okay, and so it's listing all of the functions in Viridis Lite for me right there. Okay, um, if you, <laughs> the package stats, it's really long. There's like 200 some odd uh, functions in it. Um, but I picked this one for the actual markdown because it's not nearly as long. So. <laughs> Okay, so at this point, I want you to, to, to stop really quickly and check your understanding. Um, go ahead and try to just write your answers here. Add the packages dplyr and ggplot2 to your global environment with library. Uh, define the function mean in the base package. What environments does R have to search and in what order? Okay, so go ahead and write your, uh, write your answer here. If you need to do a little R code, make a little, little R code chunk. Um, and I'll take a quick break here. Uh, to let you do that. Hit pause if you need to. Okay, so hopefully you've done that successfully, right? And that might involve, you know, using the, I don't know, search function to look at the environments that you've loaded and the order in which uh, that happens. So Mina, again, is in the base package of R. Okie dokie. So let's go on and talk about functions. What use are functions? Why should you care? Maybe you're not a computer programmer. Maybe you're just a biologist who, you know, what needs to run some stats now and again. Why should you care about learning how to code functions? The one and only thing that computers do well, really good, is repetition. Repeating things exactly the same way thousands of times is literally what computers do best. I mean, it's like one of the only things they do really, really well, okay? Um, in order to take advantage of this feature, you need a way of giving a standard set of instructions to the computer so that it can do this repetition without us having to like intervene in every step and run everything a little bit, right? 
um, functions are a way to do this. So functions are a set of instructions for the computer. Uh, they take and they run without you having to intervene in any of it, okay? And you can make them a little bit modular so that you can run them slightly differently. Um, and again, have that entire set of uh, instructions run without having to, to monkey around with it. Think of functions like recipes. They tell you all the steps to do um, to make a cake, but without the original author having to actually look over your shoulder and telling uh, and tell you what to do next. Okay, that's what it's great. Uh, we're, so we're going to treat functions like recipes. So let's talk about functions and their parts. Okay, so here's a recipe for chocolate cake, not a function, but it's a recipe. And I want to just use this, this as a comparison because I think everybody's used uh, or at least seen recipes before, right? If you're not a, a cook or a baker, um, maybe you've seen this recipe, you've heard about it being talked on the Great British Bake Off, right? Chocolate cake. Uh, this is one that I made up. It probably does not work, but I couldn't put like a real recipe because it's too long. So this is made up. You can try it if you want, like uh, let me know how it goes, but we're gonna compare this to a function. So here's a function I've named and made up cake function. Um, and here are the different parts of it here. So we're gonna talk about the different parts of this cake function. And this works, you can work it if you'd like. Um, run it if you'd like. There's a couple different parts too, right? Okay, first of all, you have to give your function a name. So the name here, the recipe is chocolate cake, and my name for the function is cake function, okay? So that's the name. Uh, the inputs, and this is just like sum, right? Sum is the name of the sum function. Uh, it has to have inputs, right? So for uh, inputs for the chocolate cake, you're talking about the ingredients that you need, the ingredients list, right? For a function, what you're talking about is input arguments, right? All those things that go in between the parentheses that are separated by commas, those are all input arguments. So you need to decide like what are the parts that you need to uh, do what's called pass to the function um, the ingredients that uh, need are needed for the, uh, the, the next step, which is the instructions list um, to get your output. So the next list is instructions. Okay, so within the function call for here, defining, um, you know, usually you have a, a numbered list of instructions for a recipe, one through, you know, well, four, it's supposed to be four, uh, one through four, right, uh, that you have for a recipe. And, um, in code, in the function, you're going to just uh, have everything that you consider an instruction between two curly braces, okay? So that's going to be all the lines of code, and it's going to execute those line, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, or however many lines that you want. And then you have the output. Output here is a chocolate cake for the recipe, and output for my little cake function is just the word yes or no, okay? Because it's going to do that. All right. Great, so let's talk about constructing functions. I hope I've convinced you that functions are actually a really good thing to know and they can make your life a lot easier. And we'll give you an example about that a little bit later, but let's talk about constructing functions because you know a couple of things to construct a function. You gotta know the syntax, right? You gotta know the syntax of constructing these functions before you can um, take advantage of uh, all, all the, the usefulness that they have to offer. Okay, so here's a function. Um, this is code that's written actually over here as well. Okay, so here's the cake function if you'd like to run it. Uh, it's pretty fun. Um, and then here you can run it. Of course, you run it just like a regular function as well. So um, let's look at, uh, oh, the functions. I forgot to put this. Anyway, let's look at the parts of the function. First of all, give your function a unique name. Um, it's really useful if you can give your function a name that also has something to do with what the function does, right? Because it's it wouldn't be as useful if sum actually was named like function two, because that's not really telling you what that does. And it would be really hard to remember like just a numeric list of functions. So try to give it a good name about what it does. My function, again, not a good example, but here we're not doing anything like too particularly amazing or, or anything like that for it as well. So give your function a unique name. And that goes on the left side of this assign button you know, uh, uh, or this assign symbol, right? So you're actually going to assign uh, the function to this, this object name. Second, you use function function to define a function, okay? That sounds a little bit confusing, but functions are just something that sets it up and defines that object as a function for R, okay? And the function, um, inside the parentheses, you're going to put all of the inputs, 
um, excuse me, that you want to pass to the function. So these are all the ingredients that your function will need to run, okay? Uh, in, in this uh, uh, function that you need uh, uh, an X and a Y, okay? It's because it's going to do an operation on X and Y and then X and Y here again, okay? And then you pass all the instructions, again, between the curly braces. So any, third, um, any sort of actions that you need to make uh, uh, the output that you want, you're going to pass between those curly braces, okay? And you run your new function just like any other function. My function one uh, comma three is going to um, add them and then multiply them, right? Sound good. Okay, I hope you don't have any questions at this point. This is the X, by the way, and that's the Y. You can do lazy evaluation. You can actually do X equals one, Y equals three, two as well. Um, either way is fine. Okay, so write a fun. I want you to write a function now. Okay, so write a function, um, add dot these that takes two arguments, A and B, and then returns the sum of A and B as output. Okay, include a line of code to see if the function works. All right, so I want you to go ahead and do that on your check your understanding block right here. Uh, go ahead and, and, and construct that function um, and see if it works. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to do that. Uh, pause the video and uh, uh, see if you can't get that function to work. Okay, that's really interesting. It's really good, right? And by the way, you can uh, execute these functions um, like this, okay? But you can also assign, again, the output to another object as well, just like we would do for sum or mean or anything like that. You can definitely do that with your own function. It's just, you can treat it like any other R function once you've written it. Okay, so let's talk about functions and environments because some of this stuff is, you are gonna circle back down uh, around to environments because it's, it's actually pretty important. So uh, let's look at functions. So you define this function, my function, um, which again is not the best name. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to, to write something, uh, your functions with better names than my function, but I've got to go ahead and uh, uh, load my function here. Okay, um, and, and view and here it is from the notebook, my function, uh, which is uh, x plus y is c, x times y is b, and then c plus b is h, okay? So this is within the global environment. You can see right here in the global environment for functions. Um, and then we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna call it. And so we're gonna call it by saying my result um, or answer. And in the answer, we're going to say, okay, I would like to call my function and pass it the arguments x equals one and y equals three. Okay, so what happens is that R actually creates a temporary local environment for that function. And what it does is it puts uh, as definitions into that environment. Um, so it's a child of the, the global environment whose parent, um, it puts uh, x equals one and y equals three. It puts that in the environment. It's just like, oh, here's your input. So that's what you need. Uh, you can think about this as like a uh, the baking um, the baking bench on on Great British Baking Show, right? It's temporary. It's it's sort of isolated from everything else, right? Okay. And in this environment, it's going to go ahead and do the the answers. Okay. It's going to create the C, the, run the first line, create B, which is the second line, and then create H, which is the third line. And in the third line, H is the last line. So it's going to pass that back, the answer, um, back to the global environment. And of course, since we have assigned the answer, the output of the my function to answer, it's going to put that answer in the global environment. OK, so what happens to everything else? Well, it turns out all of this local temporary environment uh, gets tossed in the garbage. OK, so it gets tossed in the trash. Um, that memory is cleared and then returned to the OS if it is big enough to um, go through what's called garbage collection, which we can talk about later. But um, yeah, so that's the idea. Uh, and then what's what you're left after you execute that function is just your answer uh, in the global environment. And then the my function still, you know, in your global environment because it doesn't get rid of that. OK, so that's really interesting. Where are C and B? Again, they're in the trash. They've been wiped. Okay, that is not information that's uh, information that's produced in that local environment, but it's not passed to the global environment. So when that gets rid of, it gets rid of those two. So really interesting. Functionally, functions only return the last object uh, generated, um, or what you tell it to, or what you tell it to return. 
Okay, so let's look at that. So how do you tell an object? Maybe I want B instead of H in this function. Well, you use another function within and the last line should be return. And then the argument for return is gonna be what you pop out, what you want popped out as the output for that function. Okay, so my function two, okay, is gonna be down here. All right, my function two. Uh, and then the result two is gonna be up there. So we uh, pass this, let me do the answer here again for that and run it, okay. Um, so answer here for three is gonna be this. Uh, so you pass again, do the same thing. We're calling my function two. Uh, we're giving it the arguments X um, and three. Uh, ignore that kind for right now. Um, uh, that's a little bit of a typo. So it's uh, the answer one and uh, answer, and then we're gonna assign uh, the output to uh, answer, okay? So it produces C, B, and H. It's gonna go ahead and run that line H, but you'll notice that it's only returning B as answer into the global environment, okay? And then all of this stuff gets dumped in the trash, okay? Um, you'll notice that H and C, again, are not being, um, not being returned, it's uh, returning B because you've told it explicitly to return B. So this is the difference between um, the previous function, which implicitly returned this, okay? So implicitly, like the last line is, is kind of what it decides to return or explicitly returned B because you've you said uh, very explicitly, look, I want B to be my output uh, for this as well, okay? So that is good. Okay, so. I want you to go uh, and do your check your understanding for this, for the function, which is it, which is it? Uh, it takes the argument J and then does the following um, operations on J within the function. And so by running, which is it for, what, what, would be, what would be the output? Would it be the number seven, the number five, the number 22 or the number 40? So what do you think it is? Go ahead and pause and, and think it out. We'll go over and answer in just a second. Have a guess? Okay, the answer is seven, right? Because this is the last line. And since we have not explicitly told the function to return anything other than the last line, it's going to implicitly return D, which is four plus three is D, all right? Makes sense. If we had put return H, then it would have been, the answer would have been 40, right? D, okay. Good, good, good. Code it and try it yourself. Like uh, explicitly add that return um, uh, as uh, an additional line, uh, return each one of these and then run it, see how it changes. Like that's a good exercise for you. Okay, so do yourself functions. Here's where we get into, you know, probably what you're here for, right? Um, what uh, should you consider turning code into a function? When should you consider turning code into a function? Well, think repetition, okay? Since computers are only really good at doing exactly what you tell them to and doing it exactly the same way every time, um, then you should, uh, anytime you have a lot of repetition, you could say, eh, well, that could turn that into a function. Um, there's a rule of three. Uh, oftentimes, every time you have to copy and paste code a third time, you should probably be writing a function, okay? So if you need to copy and paste something maybe twice, then maybe it's not worth the time to take to, uh, to write a function at that point. But if you find yourself copying it a third time, you should really just be writing that as a function and then calling your function um, instead. Uh, when you want to do a loop. So we're going to talk about loops uh, a, a little bit later, I think maybe next week. Um, but when you turn something into a loop to repeat it, you probably wanna write over a function, right? Because that's going to speed everything up. It's gonna pass it into a local environment. Uh, it, it tends to improve it, uh, performance just a little bit as well, okay? So when you wanna turn something in a loop, um, and it also like you can change stuff in the functions if you wanna rerun the loop. It, it makes it a little bit nicer to run a loop that way. Um, make things look the same. So when you have figures, charts, tables, um, any sort of output that you just want to look similar, like you have this figure and you want to make like five figures in the ggplot or, or uh, you know, and it's got this like 10 lines of code that make everything just right uh, and 
and make everything look, you know, look nice and, and uh, uh, all standardized and stuff like that. Um, look, turn it into a function. You can turn that all of that code into a function, just pass whatever arguments that you want plotted uh, in that way. And you don't have to rewrite all that or copy and paste it a bunch of times as well. So here's an example. And that's the example I'm going to give you right now is uh, doing the iris uh, data set. So for iris, we're going to do the iris data set. Okay. And if you remember the iris data set, it is uh, a bunch of measurements of iris, uh, irises. So sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width. Um, and then the species associated with these. There is a bunch of them, right? Um, but this is, these are all continuous variables and this is categorical variable here in species. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I have this code that produces three plots, okay? Um, it produces three plots uh, in ggplot, uh, which is kind of nice using the Veritas package. And it's just plotting these continu uh, continuous variables against each other. And I just wanted to you know, look at the patterns um, between each of these things. Okay, and it's nice and it's all standardized and it's all uh, exactly the same, which is kind of cool. So here's the code, okay, and here's the three different plots. Um, I, if you look really closely, what you'll notice is that I've had to copy and paste this uh, two times. And what I've done is replaced just kind of the X uh, sepal and petal. So sepal, I've replaced this with petal, right? And this with petal. And then this with petal width versus sepal length, because that's kind of interesting as well to look like, look at, but I've actually made a mistake here. Um, I've replaced petal length, but forgotten to replace um, this X label with, uh, with petal instead. So it's, it's actually incorrect there on the, the chart, which is, you know, what happens when you copy stuff? <laughs> you end up forgetting to replace and making a bunch of mistakes. So that's not as great. Another reason why functions is uh, functions are a way to go. Um, oops. So I decided I was gonna write a new function for this instead. So what did I do? I named it iris plot, which is a pretty reasonable name for this since it's plotting the iris function. Um, I'm gonna give the X position and Y position. So X pos and Y pos are gonna be my inputs. And that's just gonna be the, like, what do I want on the X? the X uh, axis and what I want on the Y axis here within that iris data set. Okay, so I have iris. Um, the only thing that I'm sort of uh, changing here is I'm using this AES underscore string, which lets you pass a string um, instead of uh, the column name itself into the aesthetics function, which is kind of useful for doing this. You'll notice that I turned species into a string, so it, it, it uh, parses that properly, which is good. And then I've automated, uh, automated the process of making the X label and the Y label here. This sub function is just a substitute function. It's taking a period, which you have to put in square brackets just because um, otherwise it's, it, it doesn't do a good job of searching for that period and replacing it with a space. And then the thing I wanna act on is Y pos here for the Y X label and X pos here for the X label, okay? So then I'm calling this function three separate times and you can look this, see this right here. And you can see now that it's producing exactly the same plots, which is nice, except it's not using the uh, oopsie daisy. Uh, you know, I'm using petal length here instead of uh, sepal length. It's not, it's, uh, and petal width, right? So it's not, um, it's not making those mistakes anymore uh, because it's automating all of that stuff for you. And it's obviously a lot less code here um, than the original having to copy and paste all of that stuff over and then worrying about checking everything, blah, 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 blah. It's just all there. All you have to do is call iris plot. Um, and of course, there's some limitations with this, right? Like I can only do continuous variables. I can only do stuff within this iris data set. But uh, the thing is, is you can add flexibility. And I, you know, when I'm constructing, uh, this is how I normally do it. I do some base thing and then add uh, features to this function. Um, as I go in steps, like get the first part working and then add something else. So here I've added an option to change the Viridis palette. And uh, so that is, is done in the scale fill Viridis uh, with the just options argument. And here I've added an input here of OPT and then I'm passing it OPT right there as well. So when I call it now, I can call it with different options for different uh, Viridis package options. So this is uh, the option A and this is the option 
uh, C, you can see these, uh, these are a little bit, uh, they're all slightly different colors, um, but it's also very different than the, the sort of C uh, default Veritas um, uh, palette as well. So that is a way to add some functionality. And again, add options sort of in passes. So like editing waves, think of it that way. Do, uh, get stuff to work and then try to add something else. Uh, because when you do too many things at once, it can be sort of hard to debug it, figure out what, what's going wrong where and, and things like that, okay? Okay, so check your understanding. Um, so uh, in terms of this, um, I have uh, a little bit of code here that I've written and this little code produces a plot. And what's happening is that it's here, it's plotting with just base graphics, excuse me, it's plotting the background, um, all of the quakes depth uh, against magnitude against depth, okay? So magnitudes on the Y axis, excuse me, and depths on the uh, X axis. Uh, it's plotting all of that data in, uh, in the background in like light gray. And then on top of it, it's adding the quakes, uh, the quake data from specific stations um, in red. So station 41 here in red, okay? So here's all the data from station 41. Um, there's a bunch of different stations in quakes. And so what I want you to do is take this code and make a function that will plot individual stations red. The input needs to be the station number. So basically you are making a little thing that will plot uh, whatever station number you pick, um, it'll plot those points in red against this uh, same background. And as a bonus, so get that working first, right? As a bonus, you can add an option to change the color of the station's points from red to whatever you define. Okay, so add that as an extra argument, an extra input argument to your, to your new function. Okay, so do that in waves. Um, do this first part first and then try to add on this uh, second part um, as well. Okay, so that's it. Um, so there's assignment 3.2 uh, for you to do. And then um, if you will read Davies chapter 10.1 for next time, we're gonna talk about conditionals. Okay, so uh, with that, I think we're done for right now. Um, I hope you have a good day and keep on coding.